Go on, so we're live. Hello, you're very welcome to uh, enter each of the, to the call. And uh, there's a few people joining the call at the moment. So uh, we'll get started at one o'clock. I'm joined, uh, privileged uh, to be joined by Henry Hayden uh, this afternoon from uh, Hayden Chartered Accountants. And we'll be discussing thinking of retiring. What are your options? So you're very welcome, Hilary. Thanks for coming along to this practice support information session. Thank, thanks, thanks, Justin. Uh, and, and it's a bit early yet just to say hello to everybody because we're waiting for a few people to come on. But those that are there earlier, yeah, you're all very welcome. Yeah. And uh, how, how do you see the, the economy at the moment or the confidence in the market at the moment? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, um, interesting times ahead for everybody. You know, I mean, look, the challenges are, are uh, that are hitting economies due to Ukraine, et cetera, are, are, are matters that the world can solve. So, you know, the quicker we actually resolve these problems, the quicker we can actually get things back. But look, we've, we've just come through COVID. We've come through recessions. We've come through crashes. Um, I think, I think, thankfully, I think Ireland's in a pretty resilient position, but um, time will tell. We just need to all work together to make things happen. Yeah, for sure. And are you seeing any particular industries under, under stress at the moment or uh, is the energy issue the biggest like cost control issue for yeah I, th for I think it's overheads and cost control for anybody is the biggest thing that's 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 hurting people at the moment and then you know it, it, the impact it may have then to staff costs etc because people have to live and if they don't have enough coming home so so there's a little piece of that that's why if we can get these costs under control we have a chance of of, of, of returning to some degree of um what we we, we now call the new norm and um, or what's you know every day every couple of with with pandemics what is the norm but but it should make things a bit easier but who can tell this could go on for a lot longer and therefore we could have it, it could have very serious impacts for everybody yeah sure so it's just uh turn one o'clock now so i know we're, we're, we haven't got a huge amount of time so we'll get started uh you're all very welcome to this uh, practice support information session uh thinking of retiring um uh, what are my options and i'm joined today by hillary hayden who from hayden chartered accountants and he's a founder of uh, hayden chartered accountants of over 40 years is my understanding and the firm specializes in advising solicitors and legal practices and I can all see what basically a range of services to solicitors that are offered there around. So we're in good company today with you, Hilary. Thanks, thanks for joining us. And thanks, uh, yeah. if you'd like to ask a question, we'll take it on the chat. We'll send out a recording with all of the slides uh, later in the week. Um, but over to you, Hilary. You're very welcome. And everybody is very welcome to the call. Thanks, Justin. And um, so let's just get in with some of the initial questions. Um, when are you planning to retire? Have you thought about it? Have you a plan? Have you started a plan? Are you considering it? And um, who, if you do so, who might take over your practice? Is your practice saleable? How much is it worth? Value is a huge piece of, of, of trying to understand where practices are at the moment and trying to trying to extract value is a big message I want to try and get to everybody today. Who can you sell to? Who's out there? How can you make it happen? Could you merge your practice with another firm? What happens if you find a suitable candidate? How do you how do you make things happen? If all else fails, ooh, what is the plan to close your practice? So let's try and take a look at you know when do, when do you plan to retire? What are you actually looking at there? For for some for some of the people that if you're in your thirties, it maybe uh, or up to thirty, it may be wish, wishful sinking. For some of us, that ship has sailed. And um, so, are you looking at forty to fifty to retire? And um, it, it we've done this for some people, um, very much so. Um, but uh, you want to have been thinking about it in your thirties and planning. But it's usually around family family situations where people might step out of practice and and they could always come back in. Fifty to sixty is certain a far more practical situation but may again be quite ambitious for a lot of people because there are other considerations to take into planning which in, into planning for retirement which we've talked about so for a lot of people the bracket is 60 to 70 uh, and i suppose what you say there is ouch am i that close uh, unfortunately for some of us yes never retire I think the only thing that you would actually turn around and say is that the two things certain in life are death and taxes. So never is not really a great option to look at. So as I say, what we want to try and do is look at how do I extract value on my retirement from my, from, from, from my practice? Uh, personal considerations are something that you should always try to take into account when you're, when you're looking at retirement. And, and you must you must map these out on a page for yourself. I mean, areas that will impact on when and how and, and, and what can you do on retirement. Is, is your home mortgage paid off? Do you have other financial commitments? You may have mortgages or investments or other things that have, have debts on them, or you may have other financial commitments out there that have to be considered. Um, if you don't have your own house, for example, do I have to fund future rental payments into retirement? Do you have dependents? 
again, another very interesting question, because with what's facing the young people today with first time buyers and our kids trying to buy houses, etc., the bank of dad and mum are under considerable pressure. So these are things that you also have to take into account. How much will I need to live on? Not just me, but I also have to think of those dependents as well. My husband, my wife. Are there underlying health issues that we need to consider as well that we have to take into account because there's costs associated with that and am I fully insured for all those costs? So we have to consider those. Early retirement is something that lots of people talk about and consider and for a lot of people that's what you want to do. There may be many reasons for that. Other business goals, objectives, such as other things that you want to do or achieve in life. And um, in order to do so, you must have thought and planned your, plan, your, 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 your retirement at an earlier age. That's why we put up the slide a second ago. So your pension benefits have a huge impact on early retirement. Other assets and investments that you have, if they're free of debt, they may be assets and incomes that you can rely on. You may decide to retire early because you want to travel. You want to travel abroad and you want to do it while you can still enjoy it. Or leisure pursuits. You may want to play more golf. You may want to play more bridge. All very valid reasons for retiring and for what you want to do. Um, but what we're going to focus on now is the business considerations and where we take that. Uh, and, and what we need to consider about the business situations is how do we extract value from your business? Um, uh, and, and how do we do it? But what we need to do is to consider some of the different business scenarios that would exist. For a sole practitioner, for example, the options that exist at a point in time are, can I sell my practice? Can I merge my practice? Can I add a partner into it, bring in a partner? It might be an employee or it might be, it might be a staff member. Or if I can't do any of these, am I facing close down with my practice? If you're a partner in existing practice, um, uh, in, ter in terms of, um, uh, and you're looking at retirement, because we've dealt with a number of these situations for, for partners who want to exit out of a practice. Can I sell my share to an existing partner, back to the firm, or to somebody new who might be an employee, can I sell or merge the firm, i.e. the partners all grow old together and they want to consider how do we deal with it? Do we merge with another younger firm or what do we do? Do I resign or leave? A lot of the bigger firms, you come in with nothing, you leave with nothing. Is that right? Maybe a question for another day. Or do does the practice, the firm itself have to look at close down completely in terms of what they're looking at. So if we take a look at close down, and I don't want to spend too much time on the close down, because really, if you're closing down the practice, you're going to be faced with it with a very tedious, expensive, time consuming and stressful situation. And as you close down the practice, you're going to have to look at your bank your overdrafts, your client funds, your, your staff, redundancies, training contracts. Do you have a property? Do you need to lease it? Insurance, runoff cover, claims, file storage. I can keep going on. It just sounds very, very strong and tedious in terms of what you're looking at. So uh, most of the solicitors that I talk to and that I deal with don't are, are looking for a, a way around actually close down and on the right hand side you look at some of the the the, the technical sides of writing to clients etc and the runoff cover on what you need to do yeah, and, and I think most of you will be experienced enough to know about that so what we will actually do is let's talk about the other situations and how do we extract value when we're talking about um a partnership and it's an existing partner um, and we're trying to unlock value. And we've we've covered a few of those situations where somebody has, has reached it and they're maybe a little bit ahead of others or they're, it's just their time. There can be lots of different reasons why people want to do it. As I say, they could be at 60, they could be at 65, they could be at 55. So the, some of the things we actually try to look at is we try to get a value on that person's partnership share. That means involve, that involves valuing the partnership itself then it also involves trying to take a look at the at the partnership agreement and does the partnership agreement provide in any shape or fashion for the partner's retirement can i actually sell my partnership share and um, is it provided for within the partnership agreement and in a lot of partnership agreements i've looked at and um, this is not something that is actually provided for sometimes it can be difficult to do but maybe there should be stronger provisions renegotiating a partnership agreement to facilitate this is something that becomes important now, to do so, you have to have um, uh, like-minded people on the other side of the transaction, i.e. that if it's your other partners um, and, and, and they're willing to allow you, that it can happen. So it, it does become important for partnerships to have a succession plan that allows for partnerships retirement. And um, as I've said, look, the, the value of, of your share becomes very, very important. 
how much am I owed on the partner's capital account is in addition potentially to any of that value that you're looking at. And what we're also looking at then is, is there a cash flow plan and a timetable for being able to um, exercise a repayment of your capital account and maybe repayment of your, of, of your time set? So all of this requires a plan of action. And sometimes it's helpful to have somebody else um, somebody else to talk to, somebody else to, to, to work with as to developing that plan of action. Similarly, so, uh, quick quick question, Henry, and you might do it as, as we go along, but the valuation of my partnership share, what's the process for that? The process, generally speaking, Justin, when we're trying, trying, taking evaluation is we look at the last three, four years of somebody's accounts and we then start looking at a breakdown of the business. But I'm actually going to deal with that now in a minute. So let's let's come back. Let's come back to that and see whether I've dealt with it adequately or not. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you're a sole practitioner and, and you want to take in a partner, um, early succession planning becomes important because the time to look at that is not when you're 70. The time to look at that probably is to try and take a look and say, am I a sole practitioner and, do I, and, I'm, and am I happy to become a partnership? There's a lot of different um, elements to that. Finding the right candidate, promotion from within, can the practice afford it is an important, I mean, there's a lot of important pieces in there. Sometimes can the practice not afford it is another question. Um, because if you're in a situation where you are actually trying to look at how am I going to, how, how am I going to retire ultimately, um, you have to provide for succession. So sometimes looking inside and taking on a partner. Again, we've done a number of these situations and, and, and in, at, at all age levels, we've done them from people who are closer to retirement who might decide at 60 that they take in a partner, but they're going to continue to work within the partnership for a few years so they can help somebody bed in. But the discussion has happened already that this person is actually maybe buying into the partnership or maybe um, and, and buying out and buying the person out when it's there. So there are... Um, there are a lot of challenges involved in that. There's challenges of partnership too, which you have to consider. And these are things we have to, we actually have to sit down sometimes. I'm I'm a little bit more than an accountant at times you're a counselor because you've got to actually make sure that people are, you know, that people know that suddenly I used to make all the decisions and now um, two of us or three of us make all those decisions and they become important change factors to how you run your business. Um, but ultimately, Again, it's about creating a plan, making sure that you've looked at the financials, look at the valuation of your practice itself, and look at then how do you actually bring somebody in and under what terms that you're actually going to do it. And um, if we if we if we keep and go forward, because I want to try and cover all of the different situations, because I again appreciate there's a lot of different people with different interests out there. And um, if you're a sole practitioner or indeed a partnership, it can be a very mature partnership, for example, and we've seen those situations over the last two years as well, and you want to merge your practice, it may be merged with another practitioner, or it means merging with an existing partnership, so two, it may be a two firm practice merging with another two firm practice, um, or we had one very, very successful one there earlier this year, where it was a, a sole practitioner merging with a two partner practice and, uh, you know, a substantial fee income being earned on all sides. So again, a lot of challenges of making sure that when you do the value extraction, that you're looking at doing that value extraction, recognizing that you've got the before and after that you have to look at for, for all of the solicitors, i.e. what's their value beforehand for, for all parties, what's their value afterwards, and how do you make sure that you've come together with a fair, with a fair deal for everybody? Um, the partnership agreement always becomes important. What ex exists already and how does that need to be amended? Uh, so there are many different aspects to it, to, to include the due diligence, the legal and commercial, the, and the financial review. And, and again, and you, I'm conscious of the question you've asked, Justin, so I will come back to it because we're going to go into the values. But there are other pieces that you have to consider, which are all part of the retirement plan that you're looking at, is staff requirements, making sure that staff in any merger or sale or even bringing in a partner are looked after the existing staff. The location and premises becomes important. Technology challenges can actually, that was one of the things that we looked at, different people, different firms using different systems, and how do we merge them? So there's a lot of different pieces that even though it forms part of your retirement plan, when you're doing a merger with another firm, a lot of the reasons we see for that is because people want to actually look at how do I get out and how do I create that value? So, and again, so you must have a merger plan and you must have transition issues to actually try and deal with too. So, if I'm selling my practice as a sole practitioner or even as a partnership, you know, typically for a sole practitioner, it can be difficult. The duty of care to staff, 
loyalty to clients, the emotional attachments are huge in a lot of these situations. And I've sat in lots of kitchens around the country where people, they want to know who's who's the person buying sometimes because they're not sure whether they'll look after their clients well enough or not. So we're back to how do we extract the value for your practice? Is there a suitable buyer for your practice? So again, not always the case. And certainly with, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in the market on trying to create that platform for buyers and sellers to be able to come together for law firms and for legal practice. And that's something Justin and I might take up uh, uh, offline after this, but it is something that's badly needed. And um, how do I find a buyer? Because it's one of the difficult things in there is, um, if you're if you're in practice in a, in a, in a rural town and, um, uh, or even anywhere anywhere in the country for that matter it's difficult to put you don't put a for sale sign up outside the practice and um, you don't put you don't write to all your local people telling them guess what i'm for sale but yet you do have to because if you don't do something you're not going to put the sign up but you do have to let people know because if you don't let people know how is somebody going to be able to buy you so you have to actually take a look at how do you prepare your practice for sale and do you have a plan so we come back to some of the things that you mentioned there, that when we actually look at how do we value a practice and how do we get the value out? Profit, profitability is the key, ultimately, with a solid track record for any, for any practice, sole practitioner, small partnership or otherwise. So what we're looking at is that the practice can actually either generate surplus profit, that's going to be a bonus to somebody, i.e. that if you have a practice that's turning over, say, 400,000 a year and this, and it's making a profit of two, and the solicitor can is you know you'd say a salary for the solicitor might be 120 for for a sole practitioner. Okay, we're now making 80 thousand profit. That's surplus profit. So another practitioner might say, I'm willing to buy that practice because not only will I earn 120, but there's another 80 on top of it, and I can add to it. So you're looking at those sort of situations. So ultimately. When we're valuing a practice, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the strong fee-based income based over several years and what's the, and, and how has that performed. You're looking at the key fee, fee categories, if you like. Is it conveyancing? Is it, is it litigation? Is it personal injuries? Is it probate? What areas are you looking at and what and what, what areas does the practice actually have? Are there specialization areas, niche markets? It could be probate. It could be personal injuries. Maybe for some people, the gloss has gone off that. For other people, it's their niche market and it's not certainly not gone off it. So if you're a practice doing personal injuries and another practice doing personal injuries might go for sale, you might be very interested in it, whereas others mightn't be. But we've got to actually take a look at all of the different key. It's a bit like selling your house. You don't turn around and sell it, decide to sell your house and just put a big board up outside and do nothing. You clean up the house. You present the house. You prepare the house. You do all of the things that are necessary. And if you're going to sell your practice, you've got to do all those things and not just do it the day, you're, day before you're, you're selling it. You actually have to think about these things quite a bit in advance, if you can. You've got to consider... And it, you've got to consider what a buyer is going to look for. So if the, if the, if the, if the, if the floor is dirty and the, and the windows are dirty and the carpets are dirty, you're not making a very good impression for a buyer. So what you've got to do is to take a look. But at the same time, yeah, there are keys. Your professional indemnity insurance and your claims record are all very, very important parts of how you're going to ultimately sell yourself and what you're trying to do. Your geographic location can be very strong. That could be a plus or a minus because sometimes you're in a rural town and it's difficult to attract maybe buyers to that town. There are areas that we have to work harder on and try and see because particularly with modern, if you like, communications and transport, not everybody necessarily wants to stay in Dublin as to where they are. So considerations for the seller are you must obtain a value for your practice. What you're selling is what you've built. That's what you're selling. So you're so there's a financial appraisal to that, but there's also all the other side to it, which is what are your what are your strengths? What are your what what does your practice have to offer? So some of the things, so the valuation becomes very important. I said, you know, usually we're looking at, depending on the circumstances, three to five years track record, but we'll be focusing more on the last three years. Um, but in that period, we've had COVID. So that's made it difficult for people in terms of what they're looking at and in terms of how you actually value. But most people, we've had enough time since COVID to actually sort of get things. And you're looking at a track record. You're looking at how people are performing. You're looking at how the value is there for somebody else coming in and you're trying to sell that value to somebody as to what they're, what they're doing. You do need to, as a seller, look and set out your key objectives. Sometimes, if you have example, you can have 
pension, you can have everything sorted, you can, you can be very wealthy and you just decide, I just want a good home. I'm not really interested in extracting all the value out of my practice. Uh, I don't need all of it. I'm happy, I'm willing to be, uh, to compromise. That's your choice. But our job is to tell you what we think it's worth. Then it's the next, the next question. Then the next challenge is extracting that value from what you're trying to do. And um, you may decide that you want to be retained as a consultant, i.e. you're 60 and you want to work till you're 65. We have to build that into what you're actually selling. But please try and remember one of the things that when, you're, when we're looking at the valuation of the practice, the longer you want to stay there for the first year, that could be beneficial. You can start getting in the way of the owners after a period of time. And even in terms of how the, how the, how the, the if you like the, 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 the retirement plan and how the proposal has been put forward, we actually have to look and make sure that there's value for everybody in there. Very important to have independent advisors. Um, and we would look at that. And I mean, I've, I've been called into situations where um, the accountants, um, they have their own accountants, but they want somebody just to come in who's independent for them. And we don't step on the accountant's toes. We don't step on other people's toes. We work with people to try and just make these things happen. So we have to consider lots of different areas too. And it's very hard to get through all of it in the very short time that we have. But there's work in progress issues. There's debtors issues. There's collection issues. There's the cleanup. There's different things that we actually have to look at in each situation. Um, but, but it is important to market your practice for sale. I, I use that term, there's no yellow pack sales solution. There isn't. You've got to actually, we, we've got to adapt the plan to suit your own, your own circumstances. And it doesn't matter whether it's a merger or whether it's a sale or how we actually um, uh, engineer, because it is an element of engineering your retirement plan. And um, I would say to people that you should always adapt a, a, a practical and commercial approach. For example, that if there's, if, if, if there's a consideration there for say let's say, let's say it's a hundred thousand for the goodwill and the, and it's a young solicitor who who wants to buy your practice but they don't have the capital and um, maybe you can agree to take it over a period of time there's different ways of making these things happen and um, all successful transactions should be on a win-win for for all sides and um, uh, and that's an important piece of the of the overall equation because if the buyer doesn't win you haven't done a good disposal. And if you haven't done a good disposal, you've got problems in there, um, ultimately. And um, I do think that for retirement planning, you should also consider the emergency plan and everybody should have one. Planning for unexpected circumstances that you haven't quite got to retirement, but you need to be there. That can be, I mean, we've had lots of people who were hit during the, the Celtic Tiger crash or COVID-19 who are planning to retire and had to hang in there a little bit longer. So you need to you need to bear in mind that whilst it's important to have a timetable on these things, you need to be careful that um, circumstances outside our control um, can often impact and we need to be prepared and have an emergency plan. Similarly for death or serious ill health that you need to put certain elements in there. Most of that you already know, so I'm not going to deal with it. There are a couple of tax issues to try and just highlight to you because again, we have to be aware of everything. You have to, you have to consider all aspects, but if, if you're over over 55 and you're retiring and, and you've been the owner of your business or a partner in your business for for over 10 years, you will you will qualify for um, retirement relief and, and no CGT up to 750,000 over 66 that drops to 500,000. There's entrepreneurial relief in certain circumstances. And um, and also a, and one that a lot of people don't realize is that you might own your practice building and you're, 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 you're retiring. If you sell that within a reasonable period as part of your retirement, you can actually avail of the same retirement reliefs that are there. So one, I suppose when I look at trying to, trying to plan for people's retirement, I have three golden rules that I work for. Um, I, I'm a Liverpool supporter, but I still I admire Roy Keane and fail to prepare, prepare to fail. It probably lives with me every day of the week. And it's something that you actually have to try and do and make sure. So when you're retiring, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So um, you need to prepare, you need to have a plan. And, and the plan is involves a lot of different areas, both personal, business, uh, and financial valuations need to be done. Remember when you're selling your practice or when you're trying to merge with another firm, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's something that lives with you forever. And um, once you've made that impression, it's there. I know we say we should never judge a book by its cover, but we all do. So that's, again, very important to present. If you're going to unlock the value in your practice as part of your retirement, these are important little things to just try and remember. So some of the big um, takeaways, 
I believe that there is value in everybody's practice. You know, even even if the consideration is very low, and um, there's still a way to un- unlock that value. And um, yes, if you're only turning over a hundred thousand or one hundred and fifty thousand, it is difficult. It is much more difficult. But most sole practitioners are doing a little bit better than that. You need to establish that value. That to do that, you need to get a valuation carried out. You need to find the key to unlock that value. That's part of doing evaluation to some extent is giving somebody advice as to this is the value and this is how I think you can actually put together your retirement plan to unlock it. You need to set your goals and objectives and be quite clear in those goals and objectives um, as to what you want to achieve personally and from a business. Be clear on your timetable because it does take a little bit of time with the best will in the world. Um, There's a lot of different steps in it and you have to take the steps and, and, and take your time. It's not, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't have to be a sprint in, uh, in terms of what you're doing. You sound commercial business sense in terms of what you're doing. Um, and that just means making good business decisions, but be flexible and use common sense because that's important because, you know, as I say, it might mean that you don't get all your money up front, but you're paid over a period of time. And I think it's also important uh, and, and select your advisors carefully. I think I was once told that the most important decision you ever make in life is choosing your parents, but that's more to do with your health. But I think when it comes to your finance and your business, the most important thing you do is choose your advisors. And I think you all know that um, pretty much from how you work with your own clients and how you actually deal with stuff. So, um, Justin, I know I've kind of raced through that, but there was a lot of points to actually try and go through and try and deal with it. There's a lot of, and you know, we've had a lot of different situations and circumstances of where we sit down and it does take time and how you try and deal with it. Um, yeah, so I'll open, I'll open up to questions. At this yeah, stage. so if anyone would, would, would like to answer a question uh, or ask us a question, uh, we'll take it on the chat. Anyway, I think that was a, like a masterclass of... Uh, uh, what, what what's involved in preparing an options for uh, retirement in a very short period of time? So I really appreciate the, the yeah. level of. Uh, Look, I'm happy to. T- I'm happy. I'm always happy to talk to people um, in terms of where they are. You know, we we we're, we're constantly meeting people all the time. We will we'll sit down and talk to them about these sort of situations. It doesn't always involve an engagement because sometimes people are just looking for information and then they have to go away and think about it and decide what they want to do themselves. And that's important. There are other good advisors out there, so we're not. You know, we work with them on certain occasions. And um, uh, I think one of the big things just while we're waiting for yeah. anybody is. Is, is the value side of things within people's practices, you know, that, um, uh, yes, there's, you know, it's just to understand that there is value there. And it's to try and see how do you extract it. So it's a double, it's a double sided sword, if you like, in the sense of re- establishing the value and then trying to find a way to unlock it. OK, and that can come out from different ways because it depends on your circumstance and it depends what options are available to you, i.e. if you're a partner in a firm, your options are not maybe always as easy as if you're a sole practitioner. Um, but then sometimes even as a sole practitioner, you can have geographic boundaries, you can have discipline boundaries, you can have other things. But it is trying to establish that value. I mean, we've had I, I come across situations where uh, a partnership grows old together. It becomes di- more difficult. So sometimes to try and look at something like that and merge them with another with another practice, maybe younger people with a plan for them to step out over a year or two can be one way of dealing with it. And um, it becomes difficult. I mean, I had one situation recently where the three partners all wanted to retire at the same time and 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 they were now looking and they all wanted out and unfortunately um you know it's a it's a more difficult i was you know i i was looking at things from the buyer's perspective and it just because it, it just was very very difficult in that particular circumstance so there's and this is why i kind of say we're dealing with people we're dealing with people's practices and they're important they have you know it's a person's livelihood it's what somebody has built up over a long period of time and that requires some care and attention to what you're dealing with and why no two situations are the same there's a there's a question there in relation to how do you value a law firm do you have a formula uh, uh, what would be yeah yeah what, how do i value a law firm generally speaking what i'm looking at is um and the number of factors a review a review of the actual five the last three to five years depending on circumstances of the of the practice i take a look at the profitability of the practice i will then take a look at what i would consider um uh, what we would call ebita earnings before interest appreciation and tax what i'm looking at is what is this practice capable of earning um uh in its own right when you take out the quirks that exist within a practice example of quirks 
and the practice is there and it doesn't have a it, it the, the the owner owns the property and doesn't charge a rent to the practice so if somebody's coming in to buy that practice we have to assume that they're going to have to pay a rent or else they're going to have to buy the building as well and that might be buying the building and the practice might be a bridge too far for them so we look at what is the practice actually, what's its profitability when you put it on a level playing pitch with other practices. We we forget about the, the drawings or otherwise because the, bar, the buyer decides what their area is. But we do look at the balance sheet. I mean, and look, um, yeah, some of the difficult practices that you can have is a practice where um, you have a negative balance sheet i.e. the partners have drawn out or the sole practitioner in that case might have drawn out more money out of the practice than the practice has actually earned. Now, that becomes a difficult situation because you're actually trying to say, well, this practice isn't earning enough money to pay the solicitor. So you're looking at all those, but there may be circumstances and that's why we take a look at the profit and loss and try and put it on a level playing pitch with, with another practice where with any other practice that might be similar uh, uh, and how it could be run. So we look at that and then we we apply a multiplier to that to, to calculate the goodwill. Um, but that multiplier depends on a lot of different circumstances. It could be anything from ooh, three, three to six, three to eight. You know, it's, it's around that, but it can be as low as two in circumstances where the, where the turnover and the profitability is very low. You can reach situations. But we're usually looking at that multiplier um, of what we would call sustainable earnings for the practice in terms of what it's doing. Uh, I hope that gives you. Yeah, so that's a sort of a I historical. Hate talking, I hate talking accountancy and figures to lawyers because I know they hate talking figures. So there you go. Sure. But I mean, the, this is what it, the bones of what it gets down to in the end of the day. And I suppose in the purchase price, if it was to be agreed, there are all different ways of uh, uh, structuring yeah, that deal, isn't it? The, there, there is. And there's different flexible situations. Yeah, Justin, sorry for cutting across you, but there are different circumstances. I can have a practice that's a very big litigation practice. And therefore, I'm looking at different circumstances because there's a lot of work in progress and there's a lot of deals that are there. So we get into a lot stronger potential evaluation. But it depends on the maturity of the firm as well, because you know, if I take a firm that's been there for 20 years um, and it's got a lot of litigation, I expect it to have a lot of litigation because it's a litigation firm. So therefore, the profitability that it generates year on year is pretty, should be pretty standard. So when we're, it's, it's only when we're looking at maybe the balance sheet values because of, as to what we're actually taking over that we might actually look at some of the higher cases and some of the cases that might need to be legislated for separately to the actual practice itself. So sometimes you do have to, some of the work in progress, I would consider part of the, part of the goodwill, other areas because it's an exceptional transaction, I would consider an addition. But it, again, it'll vary from transaction to transaction. So there are a few other different pieces in there that need to be factored in. Sure. Uh, we're, we're, we're out of time, Hilary. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I suppose in summary, I mean, people need to get a plan together, both personally and for their practice. Uh, and then they need to do some sort of due diligence and 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 uh, maybe get some advisors to assist them in, in uh, get their uh, ducks in order to potentially uh, merge the practice is there anything else or or sorry sell the yeah, practice no, that's it no, i mean look you yeah. need to establish the value you, you, and then you need a plan on how to extract that value that's part of your retirement plan you have to take in all the other considerations personal and business be common sense reasonable timetable and and the, and the, and then follow through um, and that's that's what you're trying to do there are a couple of other um law society guidelines in the slides at the very end which you which we'll include for for people's benefit yeah, yeah. So we'll send out a recording uh, later in the week. Uh, I'd like to thank you again, Hilary, for your, your time and uh, very succinctness in, in, in talking to us today. This is the last of this autumn series, so we'll be back in the new year. I hope everybody has a has a good time over the festive season and, uh, and happy Christmas, if I dare say it. Um, thanks a million, Hilary. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Slong, thanks, everybody. Very much appreciated. Thank Cheers. Thank you.